Hi, this is a follow up to the previous video where I showed you how to draw tree diagrams. And in this video, I want to extend that work to drawing probability tree diagrams. And you might recognize that we had this example in the previous video where we have a spinner and this arrow is on the spinner. We flick it round with our hand and the arrow will either land in the win sector or the lose sector. So we'll either win or not win. And I showed you how to draw a tree diagram for something like that. We had that on the first spin, you'd either win or you wouldn't win. And then if you spun it again and you won, then you have two outcomes. You'll either win or you won't win. And if you didn't win on the first spin, then you could either win or not win on the second spin. So this briefly is the tree diagram that we drew for this type of situation. Now we're going to put some probabilities on this and the probability of winning, well, if we look at the sector here and the area of it, it takes up quarter of the circle. So the chances of winning then is going to be a quarter. So we could put a quarter on here. Now the probability of not winning, in other words, losing, is this sector here which takes up three quarters of the area of the circle. So that probability of not winning is going to be three quarters and we can put it on that branch there. And similarly, if we spin the spinner again, the probability of winning is going to be a quarter and the probability of not winning is gonna be three quarters. And we're gonna get similar results on these two branches for the second spin. So what we've got here is a simple tree diagram which illustrates the probabilities for these various outcomes. But this type of tree diagram is not very good when it comes to working with more advanced probability as we'll be looking at later on. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is a different style of tree diagram mainly in the notation. I'll show you. First of all, what we've got are two trials. That's these sections here, where you'll see that I've labeled them first spin, second spin. And when we look at drawing a tree diagram for this first spin, we've got the two outcomes. And then when it comes to the second spin, we've got the two outcomes coming off of each of these branches. So our tree would look basically the same, but you'll notice I've taken the branches right up to these dotted lines here at the end of each trial. Now, when it comes to the probability of getting a win, I'm going to change it now. I'm just going to write in here P for probability and then in brackets we'll put W for a win and that probability is the same as before, it's a quarter. So I'll just write it in like that. So the probability of win then is a quarter and the probability of not winning, well that's got to be equal to three quarters. It's also worth mentioning at this stage that when you look at any set of branches coming from a point here, the total probability should always be one. Quarter plus three quarters, one. You'll notice here, these two probabilities coming from this point here, total one, and so on. So if this happened to be a probability that had the value x, this would be one minus x. And when it comes to putting these probabilities on, we'll keep the probability of winning as the upper branch in both cases. So filling those in, we're going to have something looking like this. And the point I'm trying to make is that it's the notation that's changed compared to this, just writing probabilities in as values. And so I'm going to avoid drawing tree diagrams like this in the examples that I do. So I'll just remove this. And the reason is because I want to talk to you about independent events. And that is that if one event is unaffected by the previous event, then the events are said to be independent. 
And that's demonstrated in this tree diagram here. For example, if we get a win on the first spin, that would be our first event. And then say losing on the second spin, that would be our second event. Then the chances or the probability of losing on the second spin is unaffected by what happened on the first spin. And we'll be looking later at dependent events. And when we have dependent events, we find that the probabilities are affected by what went on before. And with that, we're going to be changing the notation that we use here. But as I say, we'll be looking at that in a later tutorial. So I've got another example here, which you might want to try actually. We've got here a box contains three red sweets and four blue sweets. And a sweet is taken from the box, it's color noted and then replaced. And then another sweet is taken, it's color noted and we've got to draw a probability tree diagram showing the probabilities of getting a red sweet or a blue sweet when we take the sweet out, look at it say and put it back in the box. So if you'd like to have a go at this, just give you a moment to pause the video. So how do you get on if you did give this a try? Well, first of all, we need to mark on the trials if we're to adopt this style of probability tree diagram. And the trials that I've got here are two trials and we'll look, be looking at the color that we first pick. We put the sweet back in the box and we'll have the second trial as the color that we get when we pick it out for the second time. So what would our outcomes be for the first color? Well, there's going to be two outcomes. We can either get, say, a red sweet or a blue sweet. And the probability of a red sweet would be marked in as three sevenths because there's three red sweets out of a total of seven sweets, the three plus the four. And if we didn't take a red sweet, then it will be a blue sweet and that probability has got to be four sevenths. There's four blue sweets out of a total of seven sweets. Notice again that these two probabilities total one. Now there's going to be two outcomes for the second color suite. If we took a red, we could either take out another red or a blue. And similarly, if we took a blue first, then there's gonna be two more outcomes that we could take a red or a blue. So if we put those branches in, our tree diagram is going to look like this. Now we're dealing again with independent events. Because we put the sweet back in the box, the probability of taking a red again is still going to be exactly the same as it was before. There'll be three red sweets in the box out of a total of seven sweets. So the probability for a red will be three sevenths, making the probability of taking a blue four sevenths. And the same applies for these two branches here. If we took a blue first of all, then the probability of taking a red next is going to be three sevenths. And similarly, the probability of taking a blue would be four sevenths. So we have, again, independent events. The probabilities of taking a suite for the second time is unaffected by what went beforehand because we put the suite back. If we didn't put, say, the red suite back in the box, this probability would change. It would change to two red suites out of a total of six red sweets, two sixths. And this would not be an independent probability. Its probability has changed. It's affected by what went before it if we didn't replace the suite. But as I say, that's what we're gonna be looking at later and the notation would have to change. So I hope you've got that. Now I've got another example here and this example happened to be in the previous video on tree diagrams where 
We've got a die and it's thrown at most three times. And if a six is scored, the game stops. We've got to draw a probability tree diagram. So if you watch that video, you might want to just draw that tree diagram again and put the probabilities in. So I'll give you a moment just to pause the video at this stage. Okay, so welcome back if you did have a go. Let's put the trials on. This time, the trials are going to be for the three throws. We'll just say first throw, second throw, third throw. And on the first throw, you're either going to get, say, a six or not a six. And the probability of getting a six, if it's a fair die, it's going to be one sixth. And the probability of not getting a six, well, that's going to be five sixths. Remember, the game stops if we throw a six, so there's no branches coming off of this point here. We have another go, though, if we didn't score a six, and so there's going to be two outcomes, either getting a six or not a six. And we can put those probabilities in again. We've got the probability of a six is one sixth, probability of not getting a six, five sixths. And I'm sure you've guessed what happens next. This branch stops because we've already now scored a six. If we didn't score a six here, then we've got two more outcomes, either getting a six or not a six. And if we put the probability of getting a six in, it's one sixth again, and probability of not a six, five sixths. And that would be our tree diagram for something like that. And again, we're dealing with independent events. The probability of throwing a six the second time, for instance, is unaffected by what went before it. And the same applies for the third throw. Independent events then. And hopefully this has given you an idea of how I would encourage you to lay out these tree diagrams and the notation that we use when writing probabilities for independent events. Okay, so thanks for listening and hopefully if you've got any problems, I'll see you again in another video.